Thank you, Michael. Well, welcome everyone to the second money show. This is probably our, I think it's our 14th one in a row, so we always try to come and make the most of, you know, trying to actually meet some investors, trying to meet some people lurk, looking to learn more about the industry, and it's a fairly topical time for us. So who here has seen the article that came out over the weekend about going to the States? And how many people actually read the whole article? Just the highlight. So just a couple read the whole article. That's, that's kind of my favorite part because it's, it's such a headline industry. Um, but I'll fill everyone in that didn't see it. So over the weekend there was an article about crossing the border and if you owned any cannabis companies for an investment that you'd be barred for life. Which, you know, it's legal up here but it's not legal down there so they've got a bit of a, a problem crossing the border. Are there any Americans in the room? Perfect, I love seeing that. Lots of Torontonians as well, I hope. Well, if the, the whole article, just to, I kind of want to put everyone at ease before I jump into this and then I'll get started, but if, you, if reading through the whole article is fascinating because at the end of the article it says, basically if, if the, the only way the security or the border patrol is gonna ask you about your marijuana investments is if he smells cannabis coming out of your car, which unless you're crossing the border while smoking pot at the exact same time, I have a feeling that that's not likely going to happen and this whole thing just gets blown out of proportion for uh, news agencies trying to get media headlines. So anyway, that's my take on it. But uh, I'm Danny Brody, Vice President of Investor Relations with the Dutchman. I've been with the company basically since the new management came in, in 2016. And we, from day one, had a kind of a different approach. We wanted to try to finance our company in a way that not many other companies had done. And we went out to raise money from retail investors, guys like yourselves. And we gave retail investors the first crack at our very first financing at 50 cents a share. We gave retail investors the first crack at our $1.15 financing. We had over 5,000 private investors come into our company before we even went public, which it's a good thing we grow organic cannabis because I've probably killed a small forest with the amount of subscription agreements I've had to do. <laughs> That's another story though. But um, yeah, so it's, it's been, retail has been a, a huge focus for our company. And the reason is with cannabis legalizing now, we have the ability to raise funds from potential customers of the recreational market. We have the ability to raise funds from potential patients of the medical market. We've now created this sort of atmosphere where we have all these brand ambassadors you know, hopefully looking to support our company as we go out and try to raise more money and, you know, before we went public. So that was sort of the philosophy behind why we spent the extra time, effort, and money to raise money that way. Um, so, you know, hopefully, uh, I think it's come together pretty well since, but, you know, I'll let you guys be the judge of that. So this is our company. When we got started, there is a finance team that uh, we had basically been involved in, in a couple other companies in the past. So we helped fund and take public organogram in 2014. We helped Emblem Cannabis go public and we learned so much through this process. We learned what to do, we learned how to differentiate ourselves. And the biggest thing that we knew we had to do right from the gate is we had to raise significant capital. So we came out of the gate and we knew we had to raise not five million or 10 million or even 20 million, which would be great for the medical market, but not the 100 or 200 or 350 million that you need for the recreational market. A lot more capital. We knew we had to have high quality production differentiated. And that differentiation for us came from organic. There's only two licensed producers right now that grow a completely organic product. We're the only one of scale. I'll come back to organic and why that's important. R&D, huge focus on R&D because it's been illegal for so long. We haven't been able to do the research that's needed to figure out what can come from this, from this incredible plant. Licensing deals, the US is landlocked. I'm gonna come back to that and why that's important and how we can work with US companies to take over the world. CPG, consumer packaged goods. Next step, we knew we had to create a global facing consumer packaged goods brand and then take that brand, not just in Canada, because it's a great place to live, but there's only 38 million people here. We want to take that brand international. We want to go to Europe where there's 750 million people. We want to go to South America where there's 420 million people. And then at the end of the, at the, end of the day, build a large scale position in organic cannabis 
and be the whole foods of the cannabis market. A couple highlights to date. Like I said, we've raised over 350 million so far, which fully funds our domestic expansion. We have 170,000 kilograms of annual production that we're gonna be doing 154,000 kilograms between Ontario and Quebec. I'll come back to why these regions are important. We've got a proven management team, guys that come from consumer packaged goods, guys that come from the beverage industry, which is where we feel cannabis is going. It's not just in production where we wanna have expertise. We wanna have expertise from all these large scale businesses and operations and, and, and industries where we can pull talent from. We have industry leading construction and design partners to help us build out the facilities. Because in an industry as new as ours, you can be sure that it's, you know, this hasn't been done before, right? Nobody has built these size operations uh, and been successful, it's never happened. So we wanna partner with companies that have in different industries, then bring it to ours. Aurora Cannabis invested 78 million into our company. We've got a certified organic product and process and strategic beverage division, which again, we feel that as a company, once we're able to start introducing different delivery methods and people get over the stigma of drinking cannabis, we feel that's gonna be the easiest way to consume. If you don't smoke cannabis now, what's the, likely, what's the likelihood that you will start to smoke it just because it's legal? Zero percent. <laughs> So that, that's our point. But if you could take a beverage at 9.45 p.m. with a fast-acting ingredient mixed with a you know, THC or CBD molecule and be asleep by 10, you know, is that something that might be of interest? I think you know, a lot of people think that that is going to be so helpful in, in consuming. So that's our belief as well. So we launched our strategic beverage division to come up with novel products and proprietary uh, products as well. So, and then the last point here is licensing and international expansion, which I'm gonna come back to. And again, just wanna emphasize this, organic is our brand. We wanna make sure that everything we do from companies we acquire in Jamaica to companies we acquire in Poland to all over the world remains organic. That's our brand. And, that, and the reason organic is our brand is quite a few things. So first of all, there is a hill in Knowlton survey that was just done that said 57% of consumers of the medical market prefer organic product and 43% of recreational consumers prefer organic product as well. And at the end of the day, if you're using this as medicine, at having, having that organic go into your, you know, into your body is gonna be key. You don't wanna have any toxic chemical pesticides or fertilizers. You wanna be all organic and all natural and that's exactly how we grow. Now, it costs more to do. It costs about 20% more for us to set up the facility that way because everything that goes into the operation is organic. It's all built to be organic. But we do get that drop in, in cost due to a higher yield over time because we're growing in living soil. We've got a micro uh, ecosystem in the soil that sort of thrives off of living bugs. The good bugs eat the bad bugs. Um, and through that, we end up getting a, 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 you know, what we've seen so far in our facility is a much higher yield. Now, the other thing to consider is we also get, because it's organic, organic is a brand in its own, right? If, if I took any one of you to Sweden or South America or anywhere, and you went to the grocery store and asked the grocer for an organic tomato or an organic cucumber, they would take you right there. So you instantly get that brand recognition. And it's not the difference between product A or product B, it's an actual lifestyle choice. And people are willing to pay a premium price for that lifestyle. And us in the cannabis industry right now, it's 34%. So no denying that. Responsible and sustainable, this is definitely important for us. Uh, lead certification, every facility we're designing and building right now is built to, to, uh, to lead certification standards, eGMP compliance. We recycle 90% of our rainwater, uh, environmental sustainability, energy sustainability, everything that comes into our facility is green and it all kind of comes together with our organic brand. Strategic relationships, this is also important. I touched on this a little bit, but we're working with some of the largest companies in the world to help de-risk all aspects of our business. We can work with Eaton. They're one of the largest power management companies in the entire world. We can come up with a data set, measure the power coming from source all the way through the facility, down into the lights, into the plant. What have you just done? 
created a whole eyepiece data set that you can then transplant around the world. And again, it all comes down to how new this industry is. None of this has really been done to this scale before. So we can work with these companies, come up with unique products, come up with IP, and kind of work together to, to, to build the future of this, of this whole market. Uh, Ledcor, one of the largest construction management companies in, the, in, in Canada, second largest, they're helping the construction and design. And of course, Aurora, through Aurora Larson Projects, Inc. Um, I'll, come back to, I'll come back to that one a little bit here. Hybrid facilities. Now, in Canada, louder. In Canada, there is three ways to grow cannabis legally. You can grow indoors, you can grow uh, in a greenhouse, or you can grow in what's called a hybrid facility. So in indoor, you have a high capex, you have a high opex, but you do get a very high quality product. In a greenhouse, generally speaking, because you're venting to the outside atmosphere, you get a lower capex, a lower opex, and a lower quality product. And a hybrid, you're somewhere in the middle. And a hybrid facility is a completely enclosed environment, but it has a glass roof. So you get all the natural benefits of growing from the sunlight, and we call it light-assisted growing. Now, that's important because you can still have a medium capex, you get a lower opex because you get the benefits of the sun, and you do get a very high-quality product. That's what we're growing in. Now, low-cost power is your, your two biggest costs to any cannabis grow and any operation is power and labor. So for us, it makes all the sense in the world to be located in the areas that have the lowest possible power rates being Quebec. Quebec, the average kilowatt per hour rate is 5.1. Ontario is about 13. So in Ontario, we're building a co-gen nat gas plant to, to offset that and drop our cost to, you know, call it five, five cents per kilowatt hour, but it's still, you know, still not Quebec. We also applied for the Quebec economic development rate and received it, which drops our cost even further from that. My next point here is Quebec has the second most people in Canada, 8.1 million people. You combine Quebec and Ontario together and you've got two thirds of the entire population. Let me ask you a question. What happens if you're shipping six out of 10 of your orders from BC to Ontario and Quebec? Do you think that's cheap? The amount of patience over here and being located here is very important to us. And my last point is if you look to the states to the south, I think there's seven states to the south, you got 70 million people there. And we see it in the alcohol industry, but you know, young adults crossing the border, uh, coming up for the, for the, to try our wineries. The whole Niagara region of wineries is the most active winery region in North America, more so than California. So cannabis tourism is gonna be huge. This is our Quebec facility, and it is going to be the largest organic cannabis facility on the planet. We're building just over 1.1 million total square feet, and we've already started construction. So if you look at our website, tgod.ca, you can see the latest construction videos. Every Tuesday we put up a new video just to keep our 5,000 retail shareholders you know, updated with what's happening. And we should be finished by, well, we're on track to be finished for the first half of next year. Um, and we're gonna roll it out in phases as well because it's just, I mean, the scale of it is, it's about 14 football fields in size. So we wanna make sure that we're growing in the first part as it finishes uh, and then kind of working out throughout the rest of the year. But by the end of 2019, we'll be at a full run rate of 142,000 kilograms from this facility, which when I mean, you start doing the numbers on that, 100, 142,000 kilograms into grams, eight, nine dollars a gram. Organic, we get 13 a gram for. You can start to see what kind of numbers we're looking at. Uh, and again, it's fully built to eGMP standards. If any company plans to export into Europe, you need to make sure that the, facili the facility is designed and engineered to reach those eGMP standards. And one of, the, one of the most unique points about the property that I wanna point out is the fact that it's dual zoned. So not a lot of companies have this, but with dual zoning, we've got about 85% of the property is zoned for agriculture, and 15% is zoned for industrial commercial. And what that does is it allows us to create an experience for consumers. You can not only come for a tour at our facility, but then you'll be able to buy product from the front, you'll be able to see different products being manufactured. All these different things come together to create a really unique experience for the consumer, kind of like if you think about the, the 
the agri parks, the technology agri parks in California. Um, you can go and learn about the different technologies that are being invented and created there and have an experience. We want to create the first cannabis agri park uh, at our Quebec facility. This is what we're building in Hamilton. So fully funded, again, 150,000 square foot expansion. Um, I think anyone that knows our story has, has heard a little bit about this, this property, uh, but we're looking to complete it on uh, the first half, Q, Q1 of 2019. Uh, and again, that'll be rolled out shortly thereafter. We're gonna do a first launch to 2000, um, sorry, 200 patients in January. So we're, we're pretty excited for that. We're doing our beta test going live uh, so it should be pretty exciting. But both these facilities combined brings us to 156,000 kilograms of capacity. Now, the title of my presentation today was supposed to be the future of cannabis, but there is a bit of a mistake in the printing. So I'm going to talk about the future of cannabis anyway, because I feel like, you know, legalization is coming. A lot of us know what's happened in the past. But now, how do you differentiate yourself going forward into the future? Well, for us, Canada is a great place to live. You know, I, I grew up here. I grew up in Vancouver. I've lived in Toronto for the last five years. I love it here. However, there's only 38 million people. So while it's a very incredible place because it's the first time in my lifetime that we've never had to compete with the most innovative nation in the world, being the United States, we up here have federal legality, which, you know, in the States, you still don't have federal legality, which allows us a lot more flexibility in our ways to operate. That being said, this is our opportunity, and we want to take this international. If you, you know, I told you the, the population bases of Europe, South America, all these other areas around the world is a massive market for us, and it's our opportunity to lose. So we want to make sure we capitalize on that. The first international move we made was into Jamaica. Jamaica is the only country in the world that has an actual religion based off of cannabis, the Rastafarian religion. Did everyone know that that was a religion? I didn't know that until a few years ago, but it's a pretty incredible thing. And uh, that came in, in, in the 1930s. But uh, we bought 50% we bought or 49% of a company called Epican. They're one of the first and, and completely vertically integrated Jamaican cannabis companies. They've got cultivation, they've got extraction, they've got manufacturing, and they've got retail stores. Again, if you asked me if I'd have anything to do with opening up retail dispensaries in Jamaica, I would have said you're crazy because that was just so far from my mind a few years ago. But here we are today and here I am today. It's pretty, pretty incredible. So we opened the first one in Kingston. We're going to do another five by the end of 2018. Uh, and it's just a pretty incredible opportunity. It's going to be a good hub for exporting as well to the international markets. And again, remaining 100% organic. Uh, Hemp Poland. This was one of my, my, my favorite acquisitions that we've made. It took us a long time to complete this one. Um, but if you look at, if you look at hemp derived CBD products, they act as a gateway for us into the entire European market. We can sell hemp derived CBD in 13 countries right now. And we are 13 countries across 700 locations. So once CBD from cannabis is legalized around, there's already 11 countries where it is legal. And once THC then comes in with, in with it, you can then see the whole picture coming together. We can manufacture the products at our facility in Canada, ship them all across Europe, and then we've already got these distribution and sales channels all lined up for us. Um, so you can see what, you know, we, we haven't released any revenue estimates for the company yet, uh, but you can see they're on track for, for 32 million US in EBITDA by 21. So it's an immediately accretive transaction for us. They're doing revenue right now. Uh, and they've got a lot more room to expand. 32,000 kilograms of dried hemp is what they produced in 2017. Uh, and they've got an incredible brand line called Cannaba Gold that, you know, it's selling all across Europe right now. Uh, build out timeline. So if you add Jamaica, you add our Hamilton facility, you add our Quebec facility, you bring it to a total of 170,000 kilograms. Um, again, just incredible number to, to actually be producing. And to put that in context, context, that makes us the number four largest producer for, for funded capacity. And I know people are starting to move away from funded capacity, but it's still a good indicator of what kind of size will be built out. R&D, this is a huge aspect for our company. And again, we haven't, we haven't been able to really 
perform the R&D needed on cannabis because it's been illegal for so many years. So for us, we wanted to make sure that we had a big budget lined up so we can start coming up with cultivation, um, things to increase your genetic yields, uh, things to come up with disease-resistant strains, optimizing yield, create bushier plants so you get higher yield, all these things that come into the cultivation side. Clinical trials, that's going to be hugely important for us. Uh, and of course, product development. When I talk about these different novel delivery methods where you are, you're not smoking cannabis, uh, which I think the whole world is moving away from as we, as we mature as an industry, uh, we want to make sure that we're coming up with these different proprietary products. And that's why our whole team comes from the consumer packaged goods industry. At the end of the day, cannabis is just an ingredient. And it's going to be used to you know, extract that ingredient, put it into a multitude of different higher margin products, and you know, own those sales and distribution channels all around the world, not just in Canada, uh, while remaining completely organic. We've got a full team developed for our, our research and development. Uh, I'm going to point out one person here, but Prem Vermani is he's probably the, one of the most well-known soft drink uh, scientists. He was entered into the, into the Hall of Fame, the Private Label Hall of Fame in 2018. Um, just an incredibly talented, incredibly talented man. Um, one of the things that we're trying to do is, if you look at, if, if, if anyone here has had an edible, I'm sure some of us have, you, you can't measure the, the onset, the peak, and then the offset. You never know what you're going to get. You don't know if it's going to hit you within 30 minutes, 90 minutes, two hours. You don't know if it's going to last an hour. You don't know if it's going to last five hours. You don't know how intense it's going to be. But if you can start to measure that onset, measure that peak, measure the offset more similar to, say, a glass of wine or similar to a beer, then you can have two or three, you know exactly what your desired effect is, you know exactly what's going to happen. That is when we feel we're going to start to get mainstream adoption of things like beverages. And that's exactly what Prem is working on for us. He, he, he developed all of the formulation work for any major cola company you see. He worked for Coca-Cola for, I think it was 25 years. Um, RC Cola, Publix, all these different brands. He did all the formulation work for them. Uh, and again, he spent... 20 plus years at, uh, at, at COT as well. Um, so huge, huge addition for us. And he's heading up our whole research uh, division dedicated to, uh, to, to, to our beverage. Consumer packaged goods. Now, this is what I mean when I say cannabis is just an ingredient. You can see it at the bottom, but as you go up that value chain higher and higher, and more higher margin products, you take the original plant, you extract it into an oil form, then it goes into different pet health products. Then it goes into different pharmaceutical products. Then it goes into edibles and beverages at the top with your largest global distribution by volume and your highest possible margin because you require the least amount of cannabis to go into the drink. So for us, it's all about coming up with these different novel products and again, taking them from our facilities in Canada around the world. This is our brand. We just announced this on, on Wednesday, some of our initial packaging that's going to come out. So we're, we're fairly proud of this. Once we get a legal market in Canada, we'll be able to sell four things. We'll be able to sell uh, pre-rolled joints, we'll be able to sell seeds, we'll be able to sell oils, and we'll be able to sell dried flour. It's my belief that as soon as we get, the government's indicated 12 months before they're going to allow any different types of novel products to come onto the market that we see in the black market and the gray market now. Um, my belief is that that's going to come a lot sooner because the number one goal for, for legalization here is, aside from tax revenue, is to get rid of the black market. And to get rid of the black market, you have to have an equal to or greater than product than the black market. So I think we're going to get these new products coming on stream a lot sooner than that. And I said I was going to talk a little bit about the future. I think I've already I've, I've hit a little bit on beverages here. Um, but what are we specifically doing aside from the R&D towards beverages? Well, we've announced an entire facility. We're going to build an, uh, just under 300,000 square foot facility designed specifically to grow cannabis that will be infused into beverages. And we're doing a 40,000 square foot innovation center designed to come up with novel products specifically for the beverage industry. Again, future we feel as beverages. You can see CBD-infused water, CBD-infused CBD juices, 
this is going to be a huge part of the market. And I think once we get over the stigma of drinking cannabis, this is where the majority of cannabis will be consumed. Oh, they, they all will. Yeah. There's, once, we, once we get more understanding from Health Canada and the government about how we're going to have these different products, I mean, right now the, the packaging is pretty specific. It's, it's very low key, uh, but there's definitely going to be labels on them. Uh, innovative technology. I'm going to spend a second on these licensing deals here because, again, we've got a fairly unique situation where we don't have to compete with the states. However, there's still states with completely legalized recreational. And with completely legalized recreational, they can come up with these different novel products. However, they're landlocked. They're stuck in these specific states. If you grow cannabis in Colorado and put that into a product, you can't sell that outside of Colorado. But what you can do is you can take the technology, you can take the brand, and you can license it. You can duplicate that business with our land, our facility, our team, and then take that international all across Canada, all across Europe, all across South America, and we can have all these different products. Look at, t look at Evil Lab. So Evil Lab is the number one selling vape brand in Colorado right now. We're going to manufacture that product in Canada, and it's going to be a tea god product. Same with CBX Sciences. These guys have done incredible work with alternative cannabinoids, like CBG and CBD, or CBN. Uh, Ripple SC is one of the first water-soluble cannabinoid products on the market. Now that might not mean a lot to everybody in here, but I'll tell you a little bit of a little bit about water solubility. And the fact is, is when you extract cannabis from a plant into an oil form, and you put that oil into either a beverage or a product, the problem with that is it's an oil-based product, right? So you end up getting concentrated sections of that product. It's not spread evenly throughout. It's harder to titrate, it's harder to mess, it's harder to manage your dosing, your control of it. But if you get water solubility, it also takes out the taste, takes out that bitter taste, and makes it a much cleaner and friendly experience for the consumer. So Ripple has a patent pending water soluble solution. You sprinkle it in, in any drink, it spreads it out evenly throughout the product. That's gonna be huge going forward. Once you can start creating these different products with water solubility, Again, that's where I think we're really going to start to get into that mainstream, widespread adoption of cannabis. It's going to be a lot more than just consumers looking to you know, get high with THC. It's, I think that that's really going to be the main, mainstream adoption. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, can you repeat that? Oh, the bottling plant. Um, I don't want to say too much about the bottling plant yet. However, a lot of the guys we've hired are coming from the CPG industry. These are guys that have worked with COT for 20, 30 years. We have over 125 years of consumer packaged goods experience. These are guys that have run 700,000 square foot facilities before. There's a, you know, there's, a, there's a reason we're pulling all the talent from CPG, and it's because they've done it before, and they've done it with lean manufacturing. They've done it with Six Sigma, all these all these skills that go into creating a, a, a very high quality product, organic, for the lowest possible price. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna just use this as a quick advantage, a uh, quick point. Sorry, two minutes left? How's it been half an hour already? Good Lord. Okay, um, high quality, low cost. When, I think it's the worst kept secret in the cannabis market, but for the first 18 months, we're going to have a serious, serious problem with supply and demand. We're going to have way too much demand than supply. However, that's going to catch up. Everyone knows that we're coming into this problem here with supply and demand. We need to be focused on building a high quality product, staying organic, and producing it for the lowest possible price. Uh, again, coming to the experience with all these CPG executives that we have on our team, that's going to be very important for us. Uh, I'm just going to kind of speed through. I, I can't believe it's already been half an hour. Uh, international, we've touched on that. Um, I mean, Aurora's been an incredible partner for us. We're, we're looking forward to continuing that relationship. Um, this is one of the interesting comparable slides here, but if you look at TGOD, now that we've acquired Hemp Poland, we're now operating in 15 countries, 15 countries around the world. And I'm going to finish on this slide because 
I think this is one of the most important things. And everyone always asks me, do I think valuations are crazy in our market? And my answer is no, which always shocks people. But when you look at this, you look at the top three alcohol companies in the world. You look at Diageo, Anheuser-Busch, Heineken, Constellation. They add up to over a trillion dollar market cap. You look at all the, all the pharma companies, Johnson & Johnson, Pfizer, over a trillion dollars. You look at the top three tobacco companies, over half a trillion. You look at the top 10 cannabis companies, and you're looking at, what, 25 billion? For a market in Canada that's a similar size, you look at beer, 8 billion, wine, 7 billion, spirits, 5 billion. You know, cannabis is 8 to 10 in the first couple of years. So a market that's the same size is significantly less on a valuation basis than all of its peers. And you might argue, well, Canada is small, and exactly, I would argue that too. But guess what? We're deregulating around the entire world. And we're just at the very beginning of this. Constellation was the very beginning. Sorry, go ahead. Hundred percent. I think beer is 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 going to be one of the big ones because we've already seen it in cannabis legal states where alcohol sales have dropped up to fifteen percent. But beer is going to be huge. Um, I think beverages are you know in their in their in their own going to be huge. Um, I think pharma companies are you know we've seen Colorado pharma sales have dropped uh, for certain drugs over five percent, which may not seem like a big number, but when you're spread around billions of dollars, that's huge. Uh, tobacco industry, I think they're all going to be looking to get involved. And I really do think Constellation was the first that we're going to see, uh, the first of many. Because it's disrupting all these, these major industries, right? They want to make sure they have a, a piece so they can reduce their risk. Yeah, go ahead. Yep. It's, it, I mean, there's definitely still a stigma around it. Um, people are still, people, a lot of people still think you can get addicted to cannabis. They think you can overdose on it. They think it's a, a huge problem. Um, but as, as we kind of grow as an industry and mature as an industry and there's more research and development um, put into cannabis, it's starting, you know, we're at least, we're starting to see different athletes start to stand up and take a stance about CBD being the only thing that's helped them uh, after retiring. You know, it's, it's I, I do agree, it's coming. It's, it's not coming soon enough, but I think uh, that's, a, that's a good point, it's coming soon. We're gonna have flagship stores. We, do, we don't wanna be, we don't want to go and have a million flags. Have we been licensed anywhere for for provincial distribution agreements? Oh, uh, no, no. We we're we're just in the process of of determining where we want to be, where we want to have flagship stores, what the model is going to be on on actual retailing. Um, there's still so much regulation to come out. I mean, Ontario just switched to the private model. They said they're going to do 500 stores. Um, Yeah, yeah. Well, we want to have a couple flagship stores, right? But we don't want to compete with all the distributors uh, out there. We, we want to focus where the margins are the highest, and that for us is creating a high-quality product for the lowest possible price, and then selling a significant quantity of it. All right, I'm, uh, I'm done.